got real big. Um, and what you're going to see initially is uh, is this beautiful uh, bit of something that one could argue looks like uh, code, and a thing that you could argue looks like a brain, um, a nice little you know colorful brain thing. Well, it turns out that the the text here actually is code. It's not just any code. This is Ruby code. Um, and if you literally copy and paste this into you know IRB or uh, put it in a file and run it with Ruby, it's going to print out Hello World. So uh, with that as kind of the teaser, I want to warn you this talk is not going to be extremely useful. Um, <laughs> but uh, it might be fun. Uh, I certainly think that this, this topic is how you can end up writing Ruby in this kind of a, a format. And the truth is, along the way, uh, we'll see we're going to learn a lot of very useful tips uh, and tricks, including something that I've used in literally the last day to solve a problem uh, in the course of my work. So uh, it, it overlaps with useful things, even though it's not inherently a useful topic. Um, I'm going to introduce myself real quickly. So hi, everybody. I'm Ariel Kaplan. Uh, you can find me online at, uh, at AM Kaplan, uh, as well as my personal site. I work at Cloudinary, and uh, I want to, of course, give a, a shout out to the people from Cloudinary who are uh, here, uh, who have uh, joined us from far and wide, uh, as far as right from, from here in Israel all the way to uh, Canada. Um, Cloudinary is a service that helps you store, manage, transform, uh, and serve images and videos. It's probably one of the biggest Rails apps in the world in terms of just the, the scale, the number of requests that we get. The, uh, the, the weight of each request, because we're not talking about you know, a little bit of HTML, we're talking about images, we're talking about videos. Um, and uh, it's developed you know, right here in Israel in Petah Tikva. So um, you know, we're super excited to be one of the supporters of this meetup. Um, and uh, and that's, that's, that's me presenting myself. Um, I also want to, of course, give a shout out to my mother, who, uh, who I invited to join us. Uh, she's been programming uh, for I don't want to reveal how many years because you know I don't know if she wanted me to say how many years, but um, very much an inspiration to me, and I'm I'm really excited that she's able to uh, to join today. So uh, this is the title of the talk that you were given on the on the event description: Ruby optimized for programmer sadness. Obviously, that's um, a play on how uh, Matt's describes Ruby as optimized for programmer happiness. Um, so I figured it would be good for the marketing, but what I actually want to call this talk and how I think of this talk uh, and how it's even, I think, titled in, uh, in Keynote is This is Your Brain on Ruby, um, which I think gives more of a, um, a feel for how much our brains are about to get addled, hopefully, if I do this right. Um, so I want to start out with uh, this, this slide is, of course, uh, you know, I'm super excited to have uh, my mom in the audience. Um, so there's a couple of uh, esoteric, not a couple, there's a whole actually a lot of esoteric languages out there. Um, I personally don't use profanity, so I'll just let you read what it says on the slide. Um, but uh, what you see on top is uh, a language that probably one of the first esoteric languages. Um, it uses just eight characters for the whole language. The whole language is just defined in those eight characters and it's Turing complete. You can calculate anything that's possible to calculate using that language. Um, and then people realize, oh, you can do this for other languages as well. You can create kind of a, a dialect of, of any language. Um, so Martin Klepp, you realize you can do this with JavaScript. You could write any JavaScript code that you want in six characters. There's a website you can go to. You can paste in some JavaScript code, and it'll convert it uh, into, into something equivalent using just those six characters. It's a very cool topic of like how you even got there. Um, and there are talks on that. I'm not going to give that talk today. What I'm going to give a talk about is uh, Basically, I saw this and I thought, why not Ruby? Um, and so I created what you saw earlier in this presentation, um, a dialect of Ruby that lets you, again, uh, write Ruby looking in a very weird way. So uh, let's kind of establish our goal here. We want to write a Turing complete language, which of course it will be. If you can convert any Ruby one to one to this language, it will be Turing complete. Uh, it needs to be syntactically valid Ruby. I need to be able to fire up the Ruby interpreter, uh, feed it this code, and it will know what to do with it. But we want to have no alphanumeric characters, so no letters, no numbers. And of course, we want to use as few, uh, I should have written, unique characters as possible. Um, right? I mean, it's going to be very, very long, but, um, but it's not going to have a whole lot of different characters. That's, that's kind of the idea. OK, so based on these, um, these uh, constraints, what I came up with is what I call Brain Ruby. And so uh, let's go ahead and write a program in Brain Ruby. We'll see how it works. Uh, the program is going to be very simple, uh, about the simplest program you can write in Ruby that does anything, puts, okay, just print out a blank line, okay? Uh, so in the style of how to draw an owl, if you're familiar with that, here's the program. 
Um, so thank you very much. Um, but you probably actually want to know how you how you get uh, to this and why this why this works, what it's doing. Okay. So the first thing to understand is in Ruby, if you take a string, right? We're probably familiar with the shovel operators, so you can shovel two strings together to concatenate them. Um, but if you shovel an integer onto a string, you might think that would just be you know, some kind of type error. But in fact, Ruby uh, is very happy to take that that integer, convert it into the character with the corresponding character code. So right, basically, what's a string? It's a set of uh, of character codes all strung together, uh, and then it's displayed as the characters that you know and love. So 65 is the character uh, code for a capital A, and so that that uh, capital A gets appended to the string. And so if we look up the character codes for lowercase p-u-t-s, uh, we can create a string using just, uh, just numbers. So that's great. We've gotten rid of uh, letters, but we still need to get rid of numbers. So uh, we can at least start with having fewer numbers. If we replace 112, for example, with 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, uh, et cetera, till we hit 112. Um, so that works just fine. And now we can still get our string puts. Um, and uh, that's, that's good. It's almost there, but we still need to get rid of all those pesky ones. Um, but now, thankfully, we only have one thing to get rid of. So how are we going to replace one with something that's not a letter or a number? Well, Ruby has these things called magic global variables. Uh, so these are variables that are populated either at the outset of the program or during runtime of your program by, uh, by Ruby. Uh, and they're made available to you. This is a, actually a very useful one, uh, the double dollar sign. Uh, it gives you the process ID of the process that's currently you know, running Ruby. So um, in this, I, I ran it you know, randomly inside of Ruby code and it, and it spat out the current process ID. In that case, it was 2062. And it'll be a different number every time, which seems like it's not that valuable. But in fact, it's quite valuable because if you simply divide it by itself, you will end up with the number one, regardless of the process ID. So thank you to our friend Math. Uh, this really works. You can replace every one with dollar dollar over dollar dollar, and now here is uh, our program. Okay, so it's still uh, you know goes through everything. It generates the string puts, and that's great. We can generate any string, but we're not done because we have to go from a string to a actual Ruby program. And in order to make this work, uh, to to have our string actually executed as Ruby code, we need to use this template. So let's break it down real quick. Uh, we start with uh, the dollar sign greater than, again, magic global variable, uh, which references standard out. So if you send uh, send a string right through through the shovel operator into standard out, that's basically the equivalent of puts, right? It's it's outputting whatever you uh, you are telling standard out to, uh, to take in, okay? Uh, then we have backticks. So backticks start a new process on the command line and feed it whatever is uh, the code that you write inside of the backticks, right? So it's basically executing a new process and you're giving it effectively a string to execute on the command line. So uh, we can interpolate inside of backticks, so that's nice. Uh, and then of course we have our empty string, our shovel, and then the rest of the program written here in ERB syntax. So if we just figure out what the program is, uh, right, using the, the techniques that we saw earlier to obfuscate the, 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 the code of the, of the program as a string, uh, we can use this template and it'll just run. Okay, so in summary, we generate a string, we execute it using backticks, and then we send the output to standard out. Um, so that works almost. Uh, there's just one little problem, which you might have noticed if you're paying close attention, which is that backticks execute on the command line. They don't execute uh, inside of Ruby. So that turns out to actually be the easiest problem of all to solve because Ruby, uh, the, the um, Ruby you know, command line has a dash E flag, which lets you just pass in a string and rather than running like a Ruby file, it'll just run whatever the string that you, that you gave it as, uh, as Ruby code. This is actually really useful, by the way. Just as an aside, if you ever want to, um, you're trying to figure out like how do I do something inside of sed or awk or something, um, you, can just, you can just run Ruby. Uh, there's the dash E flag, the dash P flag. They work a little bit differently. Um, but you can basically like pipe stuff into Ruby um, and then you know, do, do some operation you know, output and then pass it on to the next thing uh, in your pipe. So. Um, your, your pipelines. This is just a, a useful thing to know about. Um, but anyway, if we take Ruby dash E and we put in the entire contents of our program uh, as a string, right? So this is basically what we're doing. Uh, this actually works. So puts, I just, you know, that's the, that's the, the, the shovel into standard out uh, is really just a puts. We have our back ticks executing a new process. Inside of that process, we're interpolating the string Ruby dash E and then the, con the contents of our program, which in this case is a string puts. And of course, it could be whatever string you want. So this is how that, uh, that actually looks once we've obfuscated all the strings. 
Uh, that's our, our program uh, for puts. And this is a Hello World program. And if you squint really, really, really uh, tight, you can, you can see uh, FizzBuzz. So, um, and this, this literally works. Like you open up the slide, you copy the code, you paste it into the Ruby, uh, or you paste it into a file, run it with Ruby, it will actually execute FizzBuzz. Um, and I have this code inside of a repo, which I'll share with you later. Uh, so you can try it for yourself and you know that I'm not uh, just, just pulling your leg. Okay, so we have no alphanumeric characters. We only use 10 unique characters. And of course it's completely illegible, which was uh, very much the point. Um, I'm sure you're wondering about performance. Um, very important question to ask when dealing with practical tools like these. The answer is, well, it's probably fine. I haven't benchmarked it, but I imagine, right? They say no code is faster than no code. So uh, we have very, very few unique characters, right? It's probably like much faster than your regular Ruby code. I mean, I think so, anyway. Um, however, there's a downside, if you can believe such a thing. Uh, the, one of the big ones is you can't require other files that are written in brain Ruby. So uh, remember that each file executes in, inside of its own memory space, right? It's basically launching a new Ruby process, running the code, and then exiting. And so I can't have, you know, two uh, brain Ruby files sharing the same memory space uh, I can't like you know require another file with a class in it and then use that class. It's just not going to work. Um, now there is a known workaround, which is you could write everything in one big file. So you, you can you can do that if you really want to run uh, brain Ruby apps in production. Um, but there's another problem also, which really might get in your way. Uh, and there is no workaround, which is that the output only prints at the end. Right? Remember that backticks execute a new process. When the process is done, it'll return the string uh, that that is basically what that process printed out. And then you can do some, something with that string, which is you know, what we're doing. We're, we're, uh, we're running puts with that string, um, which means that you, if you run a web, a web server for like a week, um, at the end of it, you'll just get like a huge list of, uh, of logs all printed out at the moment that you terminate the program. And that's, that's really not what we want to do. OK, so what else can we do? Uh, this is actually a problem that I sat on for a few years. Uh, always kind of in the back of my head. I, I wanted to, to do better, but I wasn't really sure how. Um, and then something magical happened. Uh, I received some inspiration from outside, and I, uh, based on that, came up with a new strategy, uh, a new dialect of Ruby called functional brain Ruby. Okay, so what's this about? So it, it comes from this talk by uh, Yusuke Endo, uh, also known uh, on the internet as Mameter, M-A-M-E-T-T-E-R, if you're really interested. Uh, there's a link to the talk. Again, I'll publish the slides afterwards. But he mentions that if you look in that little box, you can see um, you can eval any Ruby code. Uh, he writes there using only symbols. Well, I think what he really means is using only strings. Um, and as long as you can generate strings in an obfuscated way, you can use this to uh, write any Ruby code without any letters, without any numbers. So that's that's a pretty good uh, a pretty good start, and it's something that that we can work with. Um, so let's let's basically take uh, take what he did and and try to explain it. Actually, in that talk, if you watch, he says, "I would explain it, but it's too hard for me. I speak Japanese, not English, and you know, I just I can't figure out how to how to explain it nicely." So uh, we're going to go ahead and try to explain it uh, if we can. Okay. So just a, just a quick reminder, first of all, about Ruby has these things called lambdas. Uh, lambdas are basically functions that you can define and you can call them. So you can see that in this case, we're using the stabby lambda syntax, which is you have this dash greater than, right? An arrow basically saying, okay, we're declaring a lambda. There's the body, which you put in inside of curly braces. And then you can call the lambda afterwards. You don't have to do it right away. You could do it later also. You could assign it to a variable, call it later. Um, there are multiple ways to invoke a lambda, but one way is with uh, square brackets. And so this, in this case, we define a lambda that simply uh, has the number five in it, and then when you execute it, it will give you the number five. You can also have a lambda that um, accepts an argument. So in this case, we have a single argument. The body is two plus whatever you pass in, and then we immediately call that lambda with an argument of four. So two plus four is six, and that's why that lambda outputs six. Okay, so that's lambdas. Um, and uh, now let's use that to understand what's going on here. So we start with a lambda declaration. Okay, this lambda doesn't take a regular argument, it takes a block argument, hence the ampersand. And the underscore is just, right, you can write variables in Ruby with letters or underscores. Um, and so this is just a single underscore, that's our block argument. Anytime you see underscores in this presentation, it's basically uh, like, a, like a parameter, a variable name, something like that. Okay, so this is just a block argument. Um, on the bottom, we are invoking the lambda using those square brackets. Uh, and then inside of the 
Uh, well, so you can see inside of the square brackets, right? We invoked it with effectively the symbol send, and then we converted that to a proc using pretzels, the, the, the pretzel syntax, right? Ampersand, and then a um, uh, and then a, a, a symbol which converts it into uh, a proc. We right, that that which then gets turned into a block, gets passed in as a block argument on top, uh, and then inside of our of our overall lambda, we are calling that block with those three arguments, which is empty string, the string eval, and then I've I've replaced what he wrote with puts hello world as just a, just a basic example of the code that we could run. Okay, so the, here that that's more or less what's going on, um, right? I'm just gonna kind of uh, replace a, a few things here, mainly just just again so we can see that uh, on the bottom right, it's ultimately we're just generating the symbol send. Uh, on top, we're passing it as a block argument, which I'm just calling underscore send, and uh, and we're calling that. Uh, that block, right? It's like a block dot call kind of a thing. Okay. Uh, now it's still a little bit hard to reason about what's happening inside of the lambda. I think so. Uh, we have to kind of look into what is that that send block that's being passed in. And you may remember that uh, when you use a pretzel operator, it calls symbol to proc under the hood uh, to convert that symbol to a proc. Okay. And I think if we understand to proc a little bit better, we'll be able to understand what's going on uh, in this. Uh, syntax that uh, Yusuke Endo mentioned. So uh, if we look in the Ruby documentation, we see uh, under sim symbol to proc, it says returns a proc object which responds to the given method by symbol, right? So in this case, we have a, kind of a, a classic example. Um, they, they probably could have written this a little bit more clearly, like maybe 2s dot to proc. Um, but basically, uh, we can see that we have uh, a range from one to three, which will be converted basically into an array. You can think of it as an array of one, two, three as integers. Uh, we're collecting, same thing as mapping, uh, each of them converting to a string. And as we expect, we get one, two, three, not as integers, but as strings. Okay. If we look at what's actually happening in terms of the implementation of 2proc, the Ruby documentation is less helpful. Uh, whatever automation it's using to find the implementation of things did not do a very good job. And so I needed to open up the C code. So here's what the C code looks like. And I was like, OK, trying to like make my way here. I don't really know C. Um, I looked around, tried to make some sense of it. I saw there's a sim proc new thing there. That, sound, that sounded really important. So uh, and of course, that's what we return at the end of the method. So, uh, so I looked over the implementation of sim proc new. And it was also a whole bunch of you know gibberish to me. And I was basically like, OK, I'm lost. I have to give a presentation about this. And I don't know how this really works. So. <laughs> Um, so I said, you know what, let's, let's go with the uh, classic blog post approach. And there are blog posts you can see that basically do this, which is rather than, uh, rather than trying to read the C code, let's just write it in Ruby um, and understand what's going on. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to create our own implementation of to proc in Ruby. And that'll help us understand what's going on inside of the C code. So uh, we're going to define a my to proc method on symbols. It'll return some kind of a proc. That proc will take an object as an argument. Um, what should go inside of the implementation? What's this proc going to contain? So our first attempt will basically be to say, okay, object.send self. In other words, if I have the, the, the integer one, that's going to be my object. So I call this proc with the argument of one, the, uh, the number I'm going to send in this case, let's say the symbol was 2s. So it's going to be one.send 2s, right? One.2s. So it's going to give me back the string one. Um, and uh, this actually works, okay, when I take that implementation of my to proc, um, right? So I set, uh, I, I call uh, my to proc on 2s, I assign that to a variable, and then when I map over the integers 1, 2, and 3 with that my proc, we can see that it, it works as expected, um, and it'll return the, the three strings 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so this is, this is fine. Um, let's look at a more complicated example. Uh, of where we might use uh, this, uh, again, implicit uh, symbol to proc. So we have the inject method. And the inject method uh, basically starts with, with uh, an optional base case, and then it'll call a method uh, inside. It, it'll basically, it expects you to give it a block um, with uh, with two arguments, which are the, uh, the, the accumulator, which gets passed in every time, and then uh, the new item from whatever you're iterating over. And so just to explain what's going on here, right, we're, we're saying inject, start with zero, and uh, apply the plus operation every time. So under the hood, it says, OK, my base case is zero. I'm going to add the first item in the, in the array. So that's one. 
I end up with one. Carry that over. So now I have one is my is my accumulator. I'm going to say plus is the is the operation, and then two. Okay, and that'll give you three. Three then carries over, um, and I say okay, what's the next item in the array? Three. So three plus three is six. Okay, so basically we have now um, a uh, we're we're using uh, plus to proc as or rather the symbol plus to proc as uh, basically something to stand in for a block that accepts multiple arguments. Uh, so of course, when we try that with my to proc, uh, instead, that's going to fail spectacularly. And the reason is, um, you'll see this, uh, this error because uh, we called plus and we didn't give it any arguments, right? Essentially, what happened is, we, just to kind of run through what's, what's happening under the hood here, so we have zero is our, is our, uh, our baseline, we call zero plus, and then we don't we don't have like room for uh, we never get to the to the one and so zero plus doesn't mean anything plus has to have right a, a second uh, second thing that you're that you're adding right and remember again in Ruby plus is just a method like anything else so it's really like zero dot plus with an argument of one uh, but here we don't pass the argument of one and so it's, we get an argument error wrong number of arguments okay so back to our definition of my to proc we have to make an adjustment. We have to allow it to take an arbitrary number of arguments. Okay, and actually that's enough, right? That actually works. So uh, when we try one, two, three, inject zero, and then my to proc on plus, uh, it works. It outputs six exactly as you'd expect. Okay, so here's our uh, our, our implementation of my to proc, and we can use this to stand in for the actual uh, symbol to proc to understand what's going on inside of what we saw before, right? This uh, this magical formula. Okay, so uh, when we take send convert it to a proc, right? Here's what our what our proc actually looks like, and so when we invoke it on the second line of the code here, um, so we're basically passing in an object. That object is going to be just the empty string, and then we're going to send because the uh, the symbol that we converted to a proc was right. That was the send symbol. So then we send the send. Uh, symbol, and then we pass on the arguments, which are uh, the rest of the arguments to our to our proc. And so essentially, all this boils down to, uh, once you kind of untangle it a little bit, is we're saying empty string dot send eval with uh, with an argument. And remember that when you call the send method, the first argument to send is the actual method that you're sending, and the rest of the, arg the arguments are the arguments to that method. So it's kind of like empty string dot eval plus hello world. Okay, that's actually quite simple. This is just kind of a very tangled way of doing it. Okay, now of course, as an aside, you might be thinking, why are we doing this? Why not just have string.eval and then uh, our program? Well, it turns out we can't do that because eval is a private method. Uh, and because of that, we have to use this workaround of, uh, of using send. So now you understand why we need, uh, really every piece of this is, uh, is critical. Okay. So we have this magical formula. We could theoretically at this point basically just uh, create our strings in the way that we saw before using the dollar dollar over dollar dollar. Um, but I was concerned about going that route because we already have like a lot of unique characters here. And uh, I wanted something that had a lot more overlap with the kind of characters that you use to create lambdas. Um, so we're going to take a new strategy uh, in order to, uh, to create these obscured strings. Okay, And in this case, just because we need to create the string eval, we'll create that string eval. So this should look fairly familiar, um, right? We take a, a string, we shovel on various numbers, um, but from here, we're gonna take actually a little bit of a detour. So uh, we need to start thinking in binary. If we have the number 101 as an example, right? As you'll remember, that's the, that corresponds to the letter E. That's the first number we need to create in this case. So if we convert it to a string, uh, when we pass the argument of two, that'll basically convert it to, to binary uh, and show you like the binary string representing what that number is. And so, we, we, we think about this, right? Uh, we can actually create this number by adding together each of those places, right? If we have like a one in that, in that one's place, and then, um, so can, can I show you my, no, I can't show you my mouse. Okay, if we have a one in that first place, and then a one that we've shifted over to the left two places, and another one that we shifted over to the left five, another one that we shifted over to the left six places, um, that, would, that would create the same number 101. And in fact, we can express this in Ruby using bitwise operators. So Ruby has a whole bunch of different operators that you can use on integers, uh, which do different things at, at the bit level, 
Uh, they, they split wise and and or and all kinds of things that are a lot of fun like that uh, that are actually, I mean, we at Cloud Canary actually use them, which is cool. Um, but here we basically say, okay, take one, shift it to the left six places, another one, shift it to the left five places, another one, two places, another one, no places at all. Uh, we end up with our same 101. Okay. But um, again, we don't want to use a lot of numbers. So instead of bit shifting to the left six places, we could just bit shift to the left one place six times, same thing for five and two. Um, and now we're again down to ones. And all we have left to do is get rid of the ones. So in order to do that, we're gonna, we're gonna start using the, the spaceship operator. So some of you may be familiar with it, just in case not. It's, a, it's an operator that Ruby gives you for, uh, for comparisons. So if I take a spaceship operator, put things on either side of it, uh, again, I should mention, by the way, the spaceship operator is less than followed by an equal sign followed by a greater than. So it kind of looks like a spaceship. That's why it's called the spaceship operator. Um, so uh, if you put two things on either side, the spaceship operator will return uh, either one, zero, or negative one, depending on are these two items, uh, is, is the left side greater, is the right side greater, or are they equal? If they're equal, it'll be zero. If the left side is greater, it'll return one. And if the right side is greater, it'll return negative one. So uh, if I take an array with an array inside of it, right? That's a non-empty array. That's always going to be greater than an empty array. And so if I if I write this uh, in Ruby, it'll return me a one because the spaceship operator says, okay, item on the left bigger than item on the right. Let's return one. So we had this before with all those ones. We're going to replace them with uh, a whole bunch of these uh, spaceship operator comparisons, uh, and we're good. Except that now we have all these parentheses. We want to do something with them because those parentheses again are a character that we'd rather not have. So uh, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to go back to the, the presentation just with ones um, so that we can think about it you know, without having to just translate all those, uh, all those arrays and arrays of arrays. Um, so I want to start with a very kind of a, a simple example of how we're going to go about this, how we're going to avoid the parentheses. So you can see on the left, right, one bit shifted twice is, uh, is going to become four. Right? It goes from the one to the two's place, two's to the four's place. Right, in binary, every, every place is multiplied by two rather than 10. Okay, so we can express the same thing that we have on the left, we can also express on the right. Um, if we basically take the, the shovel operator, again, similar strategy to what we saw before, turn that into uh, a proc, and uh, we can see we're, we're calling it internally, right? Uh, just think, think of uh, underscore as this is the shovel operator proc. Um, so we are uh, calling it on one and one, which basically means one shovel one. We get the result of that is two. And then we're gonna use that to, again, call the shovel operator two shovel one, we get four. So the two expressions on the left and on the right look very, very different, but they're actually really basically doing the same thing. Just on the right is doing it in a more convoluted way. So once we do that, um, we, can, we can get to this beautiful code, uh, which, uh, which no longer has any parentheses uh, necessary, except that we have that last pesky one, which is kind of a problem, um, right? So imagine that you have some kind of a number. Let's say you want to create the number five, right? So five, we're basically going to create four plus one. So we, we get four. Don't worry about how we get there. We try to then add uh, the, the spaceship compared uh, arrays, which should return one. We get a weird error, right? So it turns out that Ruby because of operator precedence, Ruby thinks that we're trying to say, right? we think we're trying to say four plus, and then the comparison of, uh, of arrays. But Ruby actually interprets this because of just the order of, of operations as four plus array, spaceship uh, over to, uh, to another array. And it doesn't know what to do with four plus array, right? Array can't be coerced into an integer. Um, so we need something to do about that last one. And uh, we actually do have a strategy, it's called the identity function. And so uh, you can see here again, we on the bottom inside of the Lambda invocation, we define the very simple Lambda. It takes in an argument, simply returns that same argument. Uh, we then pass that into the overall Lambda as, uh, as an argument. And now uh, if we basically wrap anything inside of that Lambda uh, invocation, it'll just return the thing itself. And so uh, you can think of that double underscore and then uh, brackets as effectively parentheses. So, uh, so that actually turns out to be, uh, to be pretty nice. Um, just using an identity function, we no longer need parentheses. We can instead use more underscores and brackets so we don't have new unique characters. Okay, so uh, put it all together and we now have uh, the ability to create the number 101. If we then add right at the top, if we add, sorry. So one more thing is we saw these plus signs, which I don't like. Uh, plus signs are a unique character. 
uh, we probably learned in like first grade that if rather than adding, well, probably not first grade, probably like fourth grade, but something like that. But if you, instead of adding, you simply do minus a negative, that works too, it's the same thing, uh, it works in code too. So we're gonna replace each plus with a, the double minus sign. Um, so we'll get the same result. And uh, finally, if you add on the top uh, an empty string and a shovel, we can shovel on the number and we get to, uh, to this letter E. So that was a long journey to just to get to the, to the letter, but we got there. Um, it's gonna go really quick from here. So uh, now we can just add all the other letters to get eval. Uh, similarly, we can use this to get send. You can see at a certain point, my uh, syntax highlighter just kind of gave up and wasn't really sure what to do. Um, so, uh, but here's, here's the code for send. Um, and so if we take, again, this, this uh, you scan those method of, uh, of, of evaling, basically, um, we can replace it with this. Uh, so we just replace the eval and the send, everything else stayed the same, and we can see our program right there. Okay, I'm, I'm leaving our program as is, and you'll see why in just a sec. Okay, there's one last problem that we have to deal with, which is uh, when you open up a new Ruby program and you call self, it'll respond that I'm currently living inside of the main object. Ruby gives you this main object that you start with at the beginning of your program. You're always in the context of some object when you're executing Ruby code. Um, and this is actually important. We need to maintain this in our program. So if you look at the top, uh, if you keep, you know, if you let, let's say you eval uh, in multiple files, right? So you eval on a string at foo equals four in the first file. In the second file, you won't have access to that uh, at foo instance variable. Whereas if we're, if we're uh, rather than sending eval to a new empty string each time, which is a new object, we always want to send it to that main object. So we do self.send each time. We actually do get uh, access to the instance variable that we defined. Um, that's what you can see on the bottom half of the screen. And so it turns out that Ruby gives us this really nice constant referring to the main object called top-level binding. Um, and that's what we really want to do, right? We want to use top-level binding in order to, um, to, to maintain our instance variables. And that's going to be the target of evaluating our whole program. So uh, this is what we had before, but we had basically use an empty string eval. I've pulled out eval, by the way, to, uh, to below to another uh, multiple underscore argument, just because we're using it twice now. Um, so we have, uh, you can see right at the top, we have our, our empty string, uh, eval, top level binding. So we, we're using basically the string to get to this top level binding, evaluate that constant, and then that's the base for evaluating our actual program. Okay. Uh, now what we've done is we've replaced that string top level binding with, again, more uh, obfuscation. Uh, our program is still right there, uh, right there in the middle. And now I'm going to just one line everything, get rid of spaces and new lines and all that. Um, our program is still right there. Now you might be wondering, like, why haven't I obfuscated that? Well, the answer is if you just delete the, 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 our program, you, you are left with a template. And if you uh, put in obfuscated code inside of that template, uh, whatever obfuscated code it is, uh, then you can run any program by replacing that puts hello world with whatever you want. And so here we've, uh, we've obfuscated hello world as well, but this program is, is a hello world. Um, and just for, uh, for completeness sake, here's FizzBuzz. So bottom line, just to recap, uh, we started out with this idea of, okay, we can send eval with a program, our target can be a string, um, and then we wrap it in this weird way of expressing it, uh, as uh, Yusuke Ando suggested, in order to now create a way of writing everything as strings, and then we can create just obfuscated strings and, uh, and it all works. Okay. Uh, we then said, well, but we want to evaluate everything properly. We're going to do it on that top level binding rather than on an empty string. Uh, but to get to top level binding, right, we're just going to basically do that same thing again. Uh, so on empty string, we're going to eval top level binding. That'll return the constant. And then on that constant, we'll eval our actual program. Um, and then we just, you know, pulled out the string eval because we used it twice. Um, and uh, everything from here on in is literally just, uh, just obfuscating the strings, making them illegible. Um, so that, that's, that's the whole strategy. It's actually not that complicated once you, uh, once you, once you kind of understand all the concepts and you look back on it, uh, it it's actually fairly simple, um, even if it was hard to get there in the first place. So bottom line, no alphanumeric characters. We, we had to use a few more. We had to use 14 characters um, for this to work, 14 unique characters, I should say. Uh, it is completely legible, which is really good. Uh, but we've solved our two problems because we can require other files because uh, it's just running as regular Ruby code, right? We, basically, the Ruby uh, interpreter will convert the, the string into code and then execute it. So that's good. Uh, it's not creating a new, uh, a new independent process. 
and uh, the output prints during runtime. We don't have to wait for the program to finish to get any kind of output. So that's fantastic. Uh, now, some of you will have to, you know, tomorrow go back to your jobs and, ex you know, or, or just, just basically explain, like, why you spent time here. Uh, so I just wanted to be clear, right, there were some useful things that we mentioned here. We talked about uh, the, the lesser known uh, method of uh, appending a character to a string using an integer. Um, we talked about bitwise operations such as uh, the, the shovel operator on an integer. We talked about magic globals, including standard out and process ID. We spoke about the main object, uh, the top level binding in Ruby. Uh, we talked about the dash E flag for the Ruby uh, command line utility. We explained how symbol to proc works. We uh, described the spaceship operator and we talked a lot about esoteric programming. So it's a, it's a, it's a long list. Uh, hopefully some of them will be useful to you, uh, but even if not, um, just please don't forget that code can be for fun. Uh, even if we didn't learn anything useful, I, I, I thought this was uh, pretty cool stuff and I'm really, uh, I really appreciate that I got the opportunity to share it with you. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I, again, I'm Ariel Kaplan. You can find me at these places online. If you want to look up the code, uh, you can, you can see it. Um, 